After approximately six months of waiting, I was recently one of about 40 people that were allowed on a public tour of the Nevada National Security Site, also known as the Nevada Test Site. These tours are open to the public monthly, meaning only a few hundred people are allowed each year. You're allowed to bring, well, nothing really. Identification, water, snacks, and that's about it. There are strict rules that phones, cameras, recording devices, Geiger counters, and even binoculars are forbidden. I vowed I would never go back to federal prison, so I wasn't about to try my luck. It makes sense though when you realize that the road that the tour bus is driving on, should it continue on past the furthest stop, would take you directly into Area 51. But it makes for a difficult task to present to you what this channel is about, which is telling you the stories from where they occurred. I'm going to do my best though through archival footage and Google Earth. The establishment of the Nevada test site in 1951 was a direct response to the growing nuclear arms race during the early years of the Cold War. The need for a secure and remote location to conduct nuclear tests became evident to the U.S. government. After the Trinity shot, the first ever atomic bomb, as well as the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, all nuclear tests by the U.S. have been conducted in the Pacific Proving Grounds but concerns about safety, logistics, and the political implications of these tests led to the search for an alternative testing site on the mainland. In January 1950, President Harry S. Truman approved the establishment of the Continental Testing Site for Nuclear Weapons. After an extensive search known as Operation Nutmeg, a remote area in Nye County, Nevada was chosen for its sparsely populated desert and vast land area. This region, encompassing approximately 1,350 square miles, was named the Nevada Proving Ground and would later become known as the Nevada Test Site, or NTS. On January 27, 1951, the first nuclear test at the NTS, codenamed ABLE, was conducted as part of Operation Ranger. This was the seventh nuclear device detonated by the United States, and it marked the beginning of a series of nuclear tests that continued for decades, making the NTS the primary location for nuclear weapons testing in the U.S. The NTS's establishment was shrouded in secrecy, and much of its early history remained classified for decades. In many cases, its later history is still classified. As the Cold War escalated, the NTS played a critical role in testing and developing new nuclear weapons, as well as researching the effects of those nuclear explosions. Due to its secure environment, classified experiments could be conducted. But these tests were not without controversy, as concerns about the environmental and health impacts of nuclear testing grew over time. In 1963, the Limited Test Ban Treaty, signed by the United States and the Soviet Union, prohibited all nuclear tests in the atmosphere, underwater, and in outer space, leading to the cessation of atmospheric tests here at the NTS and bringing on a focus of underground testing. The NTS remained active until the 1990s when the United States officially halted its nuclear testing program, and today the site continues to serve as a research and development facility for national security and scientific purposes while also preserving its historical significance as a key player in nuclear history of the United States. Now the tour that we took started in the confines of Las Vegas at the Atomic Museum, but our first real stop was at Mercury, a closed town 95 miles northwest of Las Vegas. This is essentially the entrance to the Nevada test site, and Mercury is visible from the highway. Once you leave Mercury heading north though, you'll drive up an incline which takes you to what was previously known as Gate 200. After crossing over this saddle, the basin comes into view. The first thing we drove past was a series of benches built in the 1950s for visual observation of those VIP individuals who, who came to observe the military might of the United States. These were usually politicians and, and occasionally news and media outlets. Just to the north of these benches is what's called the Annie emplacement, and this is where the only nuclear-launched artillery shell, known as the Grable shot, was fired into Frenchman Flat, about six miles into the distance. The benches nearby provided a great view from where that was fired and where it detonated. More about Atomic Annie later. As we continued north through the site, on our left, the device assembly facility came into view. The entire site is roughly the size of Rhode Island, but the device assembly facility, or DAF, has the highest security on the entirety of the Nevada National Security Site. As the primary nuclear facility within the Nevada National Security Site, the DAF serves as a highly classified and closely guarded hub for nuclear research and development. The facility's specialized infrastructure allows for the safe handling and assembly 
of nuclear devices and components, facilitating important experiments and simulations to advance the understanding of nuclear technologies. Additionally, the DAF offers a secure environment for collaborative efforts between government agencies, national laboratories, and private contractors involved in nuclear defense projects. The tour guide described the insides of the DAF as being very prison-like, with multiple layers of security. It also boasts an innovative protective structure known as the gravel girdie. The gravel girdie is a reinforced concrete roof. Underneath the protective roof lies a unique system which is seven meters of loosely compressed porous gravel, should one of the nuclear devices go critical. The gravel mass is engineered to flex and move upwards when impacted by an initial blast from the research area below. Following the explosion as the gas is cooled down, the gravel mass descends back into the room. It efficiently traps substantial amounts of radioactive particles under and within the gravel, greatly minimizing any potential leakage. Contain a one kiloton fizzle. You can see the five circles on top of the DAF, which outline its five gravel girdies, protecting the outside world from a potential internal explosion. As we descended down into the basin, the dry Yucca Lake also known as Yucca Flat, came into view, and this is where the majority of the nuclear tests were conducted. Yucca Flat is known by Time Magazine as the most irradiated place on Earth. It was the site of 739 tests, accounting for over 1,000 nuclear devices being detonated over approximately 40 years. Continuing our descent down into the basin on our right was a large outcropping of rock known as News Knob. This was located about four to six miles from where the blast took place out in the flat. News agencies would come set up their cameras here and report back what they observed from News Knob. We continued past the U1A lab. The facility appears to be a small collection of buildings and small warehouses, but below it sits five miles of tunnels, 973 feet down below the surface. And this is where subcritical tests are still conducted. The first stop, ironically, is where the NTS nuclear testing ended. Ice cap is all that remains of the structure built for a test that never happened. The underground tests all began their journey in a similar fashion, with a hole in a cavity drilled, test equipment installed, and then detonation. Structures like ice cap were built for all of the preceding tests, and this location was next in line to be utilized in an underground detonation. What happened first, though, was the United States signing a moratorium on nuclear testing, leaving ICECAP a few weeks short of being used for its intended purpose. The valuable equipment was removed, but a majority of the structure remains having no alternative purpose due to its bespoke design. It was set to be the 929th test, sitting ready for the package, the device. Its 152-foot tall structure and 1,600-foot hole still remain right here. Dry ice was going to be used to test the criticality at below zero temperatures that would be found in space, thus the name Ice Cap. Next to Ice Cap is what's known as the Lowball Crater, which is listed as being a 20 to 150 kiloton device. That enormous range is because that test is still classified, but due to agreements with other countries, its range needs to be reported, and that range is 20 to 150 kilotons. The next location we went to was the gun turret. This is a repurposed naval gun off of the USS Louisville, which was hit by kamikazes in World War II. The gun was brought here and repurposed as a way to observe fireball phenomenology within the initial milliseconds of an atomic blast. Three atmospheric tests on 500-foot towers were utilized, known as Diablo, Shasta, and Whitney, which ranged from 17 to 19 kilotons similar to the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and were conducted between July and September of 1957. The gun turret allowed for one setup to be utilized and then traversed to point at each of the individual detonations. This saved time and money from setting up, using, and then tearing down and resetting up for all the different explosions, where they could just traverse the gun and point it directly at what they needed to. En route to the largest crater, Sedan Crater, we passed what was known as the Bainbury Incident location. Test number 666 was a 10 kiloton device that was detonated underground. What the geologists didn't account for was a fault line ran above it, and that radioactive material vented through the fissures in the rocks. 
This exposed 86 individuals at the test to radioactive fallout. And due to the incident, had another one occurred similar, they would have shut down the entirety of the Nevada testing site. We then continued on to the furthest north location on the Nevada test site open to public tour, and that is the iconic Sedan Crater, created on July 6, 1962. This test was a part of what was known as Operation Plowshare, a program exploring the peaceful uses of nuclear explosions for various engineering and excavation projects. The primary objective of the Sedan test was to investigate the potential of using nuclear explosions for creating large, deep cavities in the earth, which could be employed for purposes like building reservoirs, harbors, or excavating areas for mining. The Sedan test involved detonating a 104 kiloton nuclear device, roughly seven times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The device was placed at the bottom of a vertical shaft drilled 635 feet into the desert soil. Upon detonation, the immense energy released by the nuclear explosion caused a massive shock wave and tremendous heat, vaporizing the surrounding earth and rock. The force of the blast displaced an estimated 12 million tons of soil and rock, creating a cavity in the ground. The Sedan test was an underground nuclear explosion, meaning that most of the radioactive fallout was contained within the cavity itself. The resulting crater measured 1,280 feet across and 320 feet deep and remains one of the largest human-made craters on Earth. It was a powerful demonstration of the raw, destructive power of nuclear weapons and their potential for shaping the landscape at an unprecedented scale. While the Sedan test provided valuable data for nuclear excavation studies, it also raised concern about the environmental and health impacts of nuclear testing. The test released a significant amount of radioactive fallout into the atmosphere, contributing to the growing awareness of the potential hazards associated with nuclear testing. Radioactive dust particles reportedly made it all the way to the Atlantic. The balance of where to set the device to create these craters came down to two things. If it was too deep, this crater would be too small, due to the effects not being able to be realized at the surface. But if it was too shallow, it would release too much radiation into the air. The 635 foot deep detonation led to a 320 foot deep crater, which proved the math right to balance depth of crater with release of radiation. After the iconic Sedan Crater, our next stop was to another iconic location known as the Apple II Houses. These two-story unassuming structures were built as part of a unique experiment to assess the impact of nuclear blasts on residential buildings and their occupants. The houses were designed to mimic typical American suburban homes of the 1950s, complete with furnishings and mannequins representing simulated residents. During the testing phase, the Apple II houses were subjugated to controlled nuclear explosions at varying distances in order to study the effects of radiation and blast waves on residential structures. Scientists collected invaluable data on the structural integrity of the houses, the survivability of materials, and the vulnerability of common household objects. Moreover, the mannequins served as surrogate inhabitants, providing insights into the potential consequences of such detonations on human occupants. The knowledge gained from these experiments significantly contributed to the development of radiation shielding and safety measures for residential buildings, helping to safeguard civilian populations during the height of the Cold War. These houses were situated 6,600 and 10,000 feet from detonation. Continuing on with the tour, we went through the drill letdown yard. Nuclear atmospheric tests were banned in the early 1960s through a national treaty, so the vast majority of the nuclear tests conducted at the Nevada test site were conducted underground. That requires a lot of drilling. Large diameter shafts were required to be drilled for all of the underground tests, and a total of 1.5 million feet of three-foot wide hole was drilled between 1961 and 1992. A total of 280 miles were drilled straight down, with some tests being conducted as deep as a mile. A 160,000 pound drill assembly kept the hole perfectly straight. A majority of the drills were three feet wide, but some got as large as 144 inches wide. We then turned towards Frenchman Flats, which, again, somewhat ironically, the last place that we actually stopped and got off the bus was where some of the first ever testing was conducted, including the ABLE test, part of Operation Ranger, 
which was the first nuclear test since Trinity on the continental US, and the seventh nuclear detonation ever in human history. The other four have been conducted in Japan or in the atolls of the Marshall Islands, in the Pacific Proving Grounds. Multiple ground and five atmospheric tests were conducted here on Frenchman Flats. The tests under Operation Ranger were conducted to assess and evaluate the performance of different nuclear weapon designs. These tests showed the behavior of nuclear devices, the efficiency of fission and fusion reactions, and the yield or explosive power of the weapons. Frenchman Flats was also the site of the atomic anti-nuclear artillery firing using the M65 atomic cannon. As I said earlier, we passed by the emplacement location of Atomic Annie, and this is where it actually detonated. If you're interested in the only nuclear artillery device fired by the Americans, as well as the man portable Davy Crockett nuclear device, I did a video on Atomic Annie a little while back, and I'll link it at the end of this video. That test, known as Grable, was conducted in May of 1953, and it fired a 280 millimeter cannon shell that exploded in the air at a height of 524 feet, producing a mushroom cloud. This test was primarily intended for military training and as well as public relation purposes, showcasing the military's nuclear capabilities. Also within the confines of Frenchman Flats were some old pig pens when they needed to utilize something living as a surrogate for human flesh, as well as various infrastructure constructions. One was a melted bridge, as well as several different types of bomb shelters, test shelters, built out of aluminum and concrete to determine their effectiveness at different ranges from nuclear tests. These shelters, made out of different gauges of aluminum, as well as six inch reinforced concrete and two foot reinforced concrete, showed exactly how they would be affected between 1,000 and 2,000 feet away from a nuclear blast. A spoiler alert, the aluminum structures melted almost instantly the 6-inch reinforced concrete was barely able to hang on and caved in majority of the side that was facing the nuclear blast, and the 2-foot concrete survived every single blast, including the largest, the Priscilla detonation, which was a 37 kiloton shot. As we exited Frenchman Flats, we passed by where the atomic forest was located. Dozens of trees were cut down and shipped to the site and then stuck into concrete and is one of the more well-known iconic videos from the Nevada testing site. Also nearby was the test location for the gravel Gertie, which found its way into the construction of the device assembly facility. One of the locations we didn't get to observe was where during one of the underground explosions, a manhole cover, which had been welded on top of the three foot hole, was launched. After reviewing the video footage that was taken of it, it was calculated to be traveling at 125,000 miles per hour, surpassing the escape velocity required to exit Earth's gravitational pull. Its fate remains a topic of debate. Some surmise that it was vaporized, going through the atmosphere, while others propose it may still be drifting out in the vast expanse of space. And it spent decades as the fastest man-made object ever, and is still the fastest object ever on Earth. Throughout its 40-year history, the Nevada test site housed research from anything from nuclear-powered rocket ships that were meant to take us to Mars to large explosives that keep military personnel safe. The final test at the Nevada test site was at Yucca Flats and was known as Operation Julian's Divider Test, and it was conducted on September 23, 1992, just prior to the moratorium temporarily ending all nuclear testing. The legacy of the Nevada test site has multiple facets, though. Radioactive fallout, groundwater contamination, health effects, environmental damage, these are all things that were protested against. It now focuses on maintaining the safety and security of the U.S. nuclear arsenal and advancing scientific knowledge in various disciplines. There are dozens and dozens of other landmark locations here that played a role in America's nuclear history, but we really don't have time to go over all of them. If you're interested in taking a tour of the NTS, I recommend you check out their website for upcoming public tours. It is competitive and you will need to probably set a reminder in order to make sure you get a spot. As promised, here's a link to the Atomic Annie video as well as another video for Air Force Plant No. 67 where they attempted to build a nuclear-powered aircraft in a secret facility deep in the forests of Georgia. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my Patreon subscribers for helping me get here. As always, until next time, get lost.